We worship and we honor you, the Most High God, the King of the universe, the Maker of heaven and earth. We assemble this afternoon not unto ourselves but unto you, and we give you a place of honor and preeminence in our midst. Lord Jesus, the Lamb of glory, the King of kings, the mighty God, the Prince of peace, the everlasting Father, the root and offspring of Jesse, the bride and morning star. We worship and we honor you. We give you a place of lordship and preeminence over our assembly. And Lord Holy Spirit, the giver of life, the revealer and the glorifier of the Christ, the God that is at work in us to will and to do of God's good pleasure, the breasty one, El Shaddai, the God that is more than enough. We worship and we honor you. We thank you for your presence, your friendship and your fellowship. As we go into this time together of fellowship, as you have uh, uh, instructed us through your word that we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves together, we ask that you take your place. Take your place of honor, your place of preeminence. Lord, of our free wills, we turn our gathering over unto you. That you will come and inspire, empower and direct all of our thoughts, words and deeds. So everything we do will be done to the glory of the name of Jesus, the edification of the church, and the consequent blessing of the rest of humanity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship, bless, and honor you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Of glory. Yes, we now worship the King. Praise the Lord. Please be seated, and at a home you should be seated. Like I always tell us, at home we should behave exactly as we would do in church. Be either in your bedroom or sitting or wherever you are. Be seated on a seat. When we get up, you get up. When we say amen, you say amen. You know, have your Bible out, have your word, your notebook to take your notes. Exactly as you would do if you were in church. It's very important. God is watching. He watches I was talking about destiny and honesty on Sunday. You know, he watches our hearts. And the way we respond, you know, in honesty and sincerity at the heart level. And that always adds or takes away from our destiny. The more honest we are, it gives us eternal life, the mercy of God. It softens our hearts. It enables us to respond better and better to God. So, please let uh, uh, join us uh, in this... Um, in the service with the word of God in your hand and give us your full attention. This is not the time to be eating or taking a drink. Don't do that. You wouldn't do that in church. So don't do it at home. You know, behave with the same reverence you would if you were here physically. Amen. Well, this is our school of perfection. We're teaching on Christian perfection using the Lord Jesus Christ as our model. Shall we bow to pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you again for your wonderful presence in our midst. As we enter your word this afternoon, we humble ourselves under your mighty hand. We pray for fresh unction and anointing. Firstly, upon my heart and my lips, so that I would speak indeed as I should as an oracle of God. Secondly, upon the ears and the hearts of all who will hear me, those of few of us are here physically present, and all those who will be hearing us remotely, electronically at home, all over the world, that the word of God will flow freely from you through me to the people, to do an internal and eternal work in every heart, including mine, in particular, to cause our wills to become more humble, minds to be more enlightened with revelation knowledge, emotions to be more tempered and controlled by the power of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Further pray as I speak, the power of the Spirit of God be released in sufficient measure to back these words and follow them wherever they are heard and released in all the earth. Power that will heal, power that will deliver, power that will break yokes, power that will free men so that they will become doers of what they hear and not hearers only. We further pray for mercy to be faithful that I will deliver the word with precision, redeem the time and say only what you want me to say. Bring it out of the treasure of this word, things you know, as a scribe instructed unto the kingdom. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. And all those in agreement with me, receiving every blessing I mentioned in that prayer in your own individual life, agreed individually with me, and you said, Amen. Praise the Lord. Yes, like I said, we're teaching on these uh, uh, Wednesday uh, uh, Bible lessons are dedicated to teaching on Christian perfection uh, um, because that's the purpose of God now. Um, many Christians 
are not aware of this. You know, in fact, you find that uh, in the body of Christ generally there is a, 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 an ignorance, uh, a great ignorance about this truth. Most Christians think like this. This is the mindset. Get born again. Get filled with the Holy Spirit. Have the power of God. Manifest the power of God to some degree in the gifts of the Spirit. Get healing. Get prosperity. Live a good life. Die and go to heaven. You know, and that's it. You know, that's the, 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 the mindset. Now, that mindset is not wrong. It's just that it's incomplete. That's not all of God's purpose. God's purpose for us is to get born again, fill the Holy Spirit, heal, delivered, you know, have the power of God, get some degree of prosperity, live a good life, and grow <laughs> spiritually into the fullness of Christ. And it is particularly true and relevant in this time we're living in. The Bible tells us that the whole creation is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. All creation, now they don't know it, but subconsciously, they are actually waiting for God to show up in the light of the perils of the end time. The challenges humanity is facing now, you know, are greater than whatever we faced in the past. You know, this uh, COVID-19 is an example. It's a global pandemic. Uh, we've, had pande we've had, you know, um, sicknesses and all of this before, but nothing like this. And what makes it particularly uh, uh, dangerous is the fact that no cure has been found for it and, and consequently you know a lot of people some people recover a great number recover but there are those who don't recover and sometimes they can't figure out why and up till now you know there's been nothing that can be said will be uh, what we might call a silver bullet that will you know so there's this uncertainty and even though many economies have been uh, uh, closed down because everybody had to stay at home. The governments are being forced now to open their up their economies, whether there's a solution or not. They're being forced to, you know, and, and you know, talk about social distancing and all of that. But they know, they may not tell you this on television, but they know they can't continue to lock the economy down. And whether they like it or not, they're going to have to open things up. And they're just going to have to trust <laughs> that people will be sensible enough to obey the social distance and all of that and, and, and trust that, you know, uh, uh, many people w w will not get sick again. And, but there's no guarantee of that. But God has a guarantee. Hallelujah. You know, with the, with the uh, invisible power of God, the great power of God through Jesus Christ, we are assured, the Bible says, we'll lay hands on the sick and they will recover. The Bible says, you know, um, no plague will come near thy dwelling. You know, uh, <clears throat> no evil will befall thee. It is only those people who have that kind of faith and are walking in the conditions that have the confidence to go out. You know, and know that, you know, in spite of what's going on around, nothing's going to happen to them. You know, and, 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 and so the world is waiting for the church. Waiting for the fullness of the church. Somebody sent me something recently. It was like a kind of taunt. He, the person is my friend. He likes me. Somebody sent it to him. And then he forwarded it to me. And the person said this. I'm just going to, I'm not going to mention any names. I'll just, you know, summarize. What he said was this. He said that all these pastors that have been preaching on television and shouting on anointing and all that. He said, where are they now? He said, if truly they had the power of God, like they claim to have, they should have Go, they should not be staying in their houses. They should go to the hospitals and lay hands on all the people who have COVID-19 and they should get them healed instantly. And then a the man said, <laughs> not my friend, but the person who was in the clip, it was a clip, said that, you know, people will be very foolish after this COVID-19 to go back to the same churches and give their money to those pastors when during COVID-19 the pastors could not come out to deliver them. Now, I don't agree with his with his attitude, you know, I think there's an, uh, 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 something of insults there and all of that, which, you know, is not very uh, uh, good and is not right. But he has a point. What he's saying basically is this. If you people claim to have the kind of power you have, how come we have not seen you in this pandemic come out publicly and display it and deliver so many people who are dying 
from this pandemic if truly you have the power of God. So I had to reply, my friend, and I said this to him. I said, I have to be honest. The man has a point. I don't agree with his attitude, but he has a point. And I said, the true reason is this. It is true we have the power of God. It is true we have the Holy Spirit. But what we have now is in a measure. And because, of the, the, because it's in a measure, we are not able to do the... Uh, we are not able to demonstrate the power of God on that consistent level that you see in the ministry of Jesus. Which is what that man was pointing to. That if you were like Jesus, you know, the Bible says Jesus went out and, and, and virtue went out of him and healed them all. Why We should be able to go to UCH and virtue should come out of us and heal them all. Now, of course, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a proviso there in the sense that the people Jesus healed believed. It wasn't everybody Jesus healed. You know, he healed a large number of people. Don't misunderstand me. But there were a lot of people. Like, for example, at Nazareth, the Bible says he could there do no mighty works. Because of their wrong attitude and wrong belief. So that kind of person who sent that kind of text, because of his attitude, even with the power of the Spirit without measure, he may not get any healing because he has a wrong attitude. So the attitude and the faith matters. The woman with the issue of blood got healed, but a lot of people were pressing Jesus that day and they didn't get healed. So, uh, so there is a, there is a, there, the, the, the bottom line is this. And I said this to my friend. I said, that's why the emphasis of the church now needs to be on teaching people how to grow spiritually in the fullness of Christ so that this kind of power this man is talking about can be in manifestation, you know, uh, on, on, on a much larger and global level than what we're seeing now. You know, and, and I said, and, and that's why people like me, you know, by the grace and the mercy of God are emphasizing that. The Bible says, you know, God has given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we be no more children tossed to and fro with every wind and doctrine and by the slight of men in cunning craftiness, why by they lie in wait to deceive, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up into him in all all things now that is not taught you you don't you hardly hear anybody saying that but that's the key and that's what the world is waiting for that's what that man meant when he was sending that tone at least we should be seeing some of you who will be manifesting the power of god like jesus did you know healing the sick cleansing the lepers raising the dead you know even if we don't heal any everybody but we heal a large number it will keep that man's mouth shut and that's why we and i'm not the only one i believe there's seven thousand who have not bad their need to bail some of us are emphasizing that what we need to know is get into god you know grow spiritually you know and inherit this power of the spirit without measure we have the holy spirit now but what we have the spirit we have now is in a measure and there are certain um, 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 challenges that the, the spirit with measure cannot overcome on sunday i was talking about this in church and it, it, it really hit me you know uh, as i was preaching it I, I was preaching it you know it's amazing to me how we don't take what i call a clinical i don't know whether that's the right word a very analytical um, uh, analysis of the scriptures. You look at the Acts of the Apostles, you know, and I said this on Sunday and I'm saying it again now, and I don't play down what they did, but it's, it's not at the level of Jesus. We only have two accounts of people being raised from the dead. You know, Dorcas and um, I've forgotten the boy's name, you know, that Paul raised from the dead in Acts chapter 20 something. Eutychus, thank you, Pastor Bwiga. You know, and thank God for that. We don't, we don't, you know, but, you know, Eutychus just died. He died, and then he hadn't died maybe 10 minutes. And then Paul raised him from there. Now, <laughs> that's a, it's a great thing. Don't misunderstand me. You know, uh, and, and Dorcas had been dead maybe for one or two days, but she hadn't yet been buried, you know, and, and, uh, in Joppa. And uh, Peter goes out there and heals, uh, raises her from the dead. But that's not, it's not, it's not like, you know, the, 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 the son of the widow of Nain. 
who was already in a coffin and on the way to the funeral. Certainly it's not like Lazarus, who had been dead and in the grave for four days. You don't see any account of that in the four Gospels. Sorry, in the Acts of the Apostles. You don't see any account of any of them walking on water. That would have been a great time for Paul to do it when he was on the shipwreck. Are you listening to me? God saved them. But, you know, it was, it was through um, um, the ministry of angels and um, 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 natural, you know, they, they used, the, the ship broke up and then each person on board. And God saved everybody. And I'm not playing that down. What I'm trying to say is that unlike in the case of Jesus who calmed the storm and said, peace be still. Paul had to endure the storm, save the people through 14 days fasting. It's the it's, it's Holy Spirit, but it's, it's not at the same level. If it was Jesus who was in that boat, that storm would have stopped instantly. Because when Jesus spoke, like I said this on Sunday, or two Sundays ago when I was talking about you know, um, servants, princes, and kings, Jesus was operating as a king. And where the word of the king is, there is power. All he would just say is, peace, be still. And that storm would have stopped instantly. In Paul's case, he had to fast and pray for 14 days. He, they overcame the storm, but it took a much longer time. So Paul was probably operating as what we call a prince, but Jesus was operating as a king. So what the world wants now is they want to see the kings. Many of us are operating as princes. We pray, we intercede, and God moves, and we get miracles, and God delivers us, and we have, you know, but we're nothing like Jesus' ministry. And that's, what, that's why the Bible says the whole creation is waiting together for the manifestation. They want to see sons of God at the same level as Jesus Christ in manifestation. And this is not a... Uh, just uh, Olubi Johnson talking and, and some of us just having some kind of um, uh, uh, we're, over, uh, we're over ambitious spiritually. I was just meditating on it as I was coming down the stairs for this meeting. You know, because sometimes those thoughts, you know, the devil come and say, look, what is this thing you're believing? Okay, is it, is it, you know, do you really have a right to believe for this? Then the scripture just comes. You know, the works that I do shall you do and greater works than that. I didn't write that. It's not, I, I didn't try and manufacture that up. Praise the Lord. And the one I just quoted to you from Ephesians chapter 5, 4, you know, that we may grow up into him in all things, you know. And then the Bible says, as he is, so are we in this world. I could give you scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture, you know, that confirms that this is the will of God. God wants uh, a company of Christians who will grow spiritually. And that's why we're having these classes. You know, we call it the school of perfection. Because it's going to take walking in perfection, which is very simply the cleaning out of the residual sin nature in the soul and the body. Uh, this scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1 defines it very, very comprehensively. It says, having therefore these promises, the promises that make us partakers of the divine nature. Dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all. And that word all there is very important. Filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting present continuous tense, holiness in the fear of God. So that, that, that's what we're about. So we use the blood of Jesus, the word of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit to clean out the uh, residual sin nature. And then again, you have to understand that when you get born again, the, the divine nature comes in the spirit, not in the soul and body immediately. You now use the blood of Jesus to get more and more of the divine nature into the spirit by cleansing the connection between you and God. And then you use the the, the, the word of God to take that divine nature and put it in the mind and the will so you understand that's why you need to read your Bible that's why you need the word of God so you can think like God and you can have uh, God's mind and understand you know what God is doing and then by praying in the spirit that's why we're praying in tongues and groaning and travail comes in you now pump that divine nature it's now converted to power when you pray in the spirit and you speak God's word that power now goes into the the will the emotions you know, and begins to clean out the, the, the sin nature into the physical body. You know, and there are scriptures that you cannot deny that they are, they are, they are explicitly there. Romans 8 11 says that the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also give life to your mortal. He is very, very emphatic. You know, so that you can't say, oh, it's going to be at the resurrection. It's, going to, it's now. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verses 10 and 11, it says, 
in, uh, uh, in verse 10, he says, we, which, you know, we were always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. Verse 11 says, we which live are delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life of God be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So, uh, this is not a pie in the sky. This is the Bible, I've just given you so many, I didn't give you three, I gave you maybe about seven or eight. You know, the Bible, everybody be established. This is an established truth. And it is what is necessary, is what the world is waiting for now. If we don't do it, they'll just think all we're just talking about is just a law of theory. But if we do it, and we are going to do it, by the power, the mercy and the grace of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, it's going to shut every mouth. And then it's going to bring in the harvest of the nations. It's what men are waiting for. They don't know, unconsciously, in their subconscious, in the deep inside their heart, their heart. Is this God thing? Yeah, and they hear some of our preaching. And they hear some of the high and great things we say. say yeah, well, let, let, let's see it now. Let's see it. But when it happens, Isaiah 60 will come to pass. The Bible says, Behold, darkness shall cross, darkness shall cover the earth. It says, But the Lord... Yeah, let, let's read it. Yeah, I, I love that scripture. This is the time for the fulfillment of Isaiah 60. Particularly verses 1 to 5. It says, Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness, like this COVID-19, and you know, all the economic problems, all the social problems. You know, there's been a, in recent times, there's been a rash of, of, of terrible uh, 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 sins. You know, there's always been sin, but you know, I, I said this on Sunday, a boy went to rape his grandmother. Now, that's, 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 that's the devil coming down. Like in time of Noah, when the Bible says the sons of God came down. The same thing is happening now. Some of those principalities, they're falling because of our prayers and intercession. It's like bombarding, you know, in, in, in World War II and even in wars after that, you know, when planes come, you, you shoot anti-aircraft guns. And if the, if, the, if the shell hits the plane, the plane is destroyed and the plane comes down. What we're doing through our intercession is we're bombarding the second heavens. You know, from our own place of superior authority in the third heavens. We're actually seated in the third heavens, even though we're not, we're, we're physically on earth. And through our intercession and prayer, we're bombarding the second heavens. And some of those principalities and powers right now, we're displacing them from the heavenlies and they're hitting the earth. And, and they're now going into men. And we, because some of the things we're seeing are unnatural. Even the killing of this man, this George Floyd, just a few days ago, you know. Oh, very sad they did the funeral yesterday has brought in an awareness you know of a need for the deliverance of the black man you know the, the, the black race you know colored people you know f from the oppression of of men that have had as it were their their legs on our neck and you know the bible actually says so my wife brought this out spiritually recently from Jeremiah chapter 30 he says I will break their yoke off your neck so it's no wonder that the first of the first fruits of the glorious church is going to come from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. According to Ephesians, sorry, uh, uh, Songs of Solomon, chapter 1, which says, I am black, but comely. Then in Isaiah, it says, from beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, God will bring his offering to Mount Zion. Mount Zion is, not, is, in, is in Israel, the physical Mount Zion. He's not talking about the physical, he's talking about the spiritual, he's talking about the church, the perfect church. And then in Zephaniah, it says the same thing from beyond the rivers of Israel, my, my worshippers will bring. We're not, it's not only going to be black, don't misunderstand me, but blacks, you know, the, the sons of Ham will be the spearhead. Just like in the first century, the spearhead of the church were all Jews, the sons of Shem. In the second, in the second 1,000 years during what, the reformation of Martin Luther, you know, and, 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 and the uh, reformation of the church, the spearhead was Europe. Now, in this third day, the spearhead is going to be from Africa, sub-Saharan Africa. Amen. And break that yoke from off our necks. Praise the Lord. And so, uh, he said here in verse 2, he said, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness of people. That's happening right now. The COVID-19 and the economic crisis that it has spewed out. You know, that, it, that, that has been a consequence of it. But... Oh, this is good. I like that, but the Lord shall arise upon thee. Now, look at the tenses. Shall. Shall means that when this darkness comes, 
you know, then the, 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 it's not the law that arises first. The darkness comes first. Then, as a consequence, in, in order to be able to rebut that darkness, to overcome it, then the Lord will arise. And his glory shall be seen. Observe, it's going to be seen. It's not going to be perceived. They're going to actually see it. It was called the manifestation of the sons of God. You know, and the Gentiles or the nations will come to thy life. They, they, they are waiting. And kings to the brightness is going to affect nations. You know, uh, let me just quickly uh, put something in there that I, you know, I, 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 I preached this on uh, Pentecost Sunday. When I was talking about, you know, shining from Zion. You see, there are, th there are three Pentecosts. The first one was the one of Moses, you know, 50 days after they left Egypt. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, God came down on Mount Sinai with his fire and his glory and spoke in an audible voice the Ten Commandments. The second Pentecost, the second literal Pentecost was in the upper room in Jerusalem about 2,000 years ago. And when that came, again God came down with fire and then they spoke in other tongues, a supernatural language speaking the mysteries of God. The purpose of that second Pentecost was to give to the church, you know, the earnest of the Spirit, this Spirit with measure, through which they were able to speak in tongues, and, and they did great works, healing, deliverance, and all of that, through the borrowed anointing that they inherited as a spillover from Jesus' ministry, and its purpose basically was to start and establish the church and get the scriptures written. And they fulfilled it. This third one that is coming now, uh, we're in the season of its, of its manifesto, because we're in the season of Pentecost now. The day of Pentecost was uh, uh, um, two Fridays ago. You know, uh, I think it was, I can't remember the exact date, May 24, something like that. You know, but whatever it was, you know, it, because it wasn't actually Sunday. We celebrated our Pentecost on Sunday, but the actual Pentecost was Friday. Okay? <coughs> and the, the, the purpose of this one is to shine the revelation of the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of life and love into our hearts. Burn it into our hearts like a, with fire. You see, in the Old Testament, God used the fire of his glory to burn the Ten Commandments into rocks, into, into stone, and tablets of stone. Here, the Holy Spirit is burning into our hearts the, by, by his fire, the fire of his glory, you know, fresh revelation and wisdom, and, and, and also um, zeal. Glory be to God. You know, into our hearts to operate the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and law, the law of life and love consistently. It is this operation that will cause the love of God to start being perfected in our lives and then it will cause us to inherit the spirit without measure. This one I'm spoken about. And this spirit without measure is, not, is, going, to, is going to perfect the church and close the age. So the first, the second Pentecost started the church. This one's going to finish it. Hallelujah. And close the age. And that's what, 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 what this is all about. And it's going to, you know, that one did great works. This one's going to do greater works. That one affected nations to some degree, you know, but basically it affected individuals and those individuals now affected the nation. But this one is going to affect nations like Moses affected Egypt. Like Joseph affected Egypt. Like um, Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel affected Babylon. Like Esther, Mordecai, Nehemiah, Zerubbabel affected uh, Persia. It's going to shake the nation and have such influence with kings that kings, and that's what reminded me of it, say, Gentiles, the nations will come to thy light, the light of this glory of God, of the Spirit without measure. And kings. To the brightness of thy rising. You don't see this happening in the early church. At least not initially. You know. Or, or, you know in fact the, 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 the Roman government. And, and Herod and all those people. They were against the church. Now 300 years later. Constantinople now becomes a Christian. You know and all of that. And we thank God for that. But really they didn't really impact the in the early church, when they first started, they didn't impact, none of, the, none of the emperors became Christians. You know, 
or, 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 or called for Paul or called for Peter and bowed before them and said, ah, truly, like Nebuchadnezzar bowed before Shidrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and, and, and Daniel, and like Pharaoh bowed before uh, uh, Joseph and said, there is no God like you. That didn't happen in the early church, but it's going to happen now. Hallelujah. Lift up thine eyes round about and see. And all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. Thy son shall come from afar. And thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Thou shalt see and flow together. Thy heart shall fear and be enlarged. Because the abundance of the sea there is not just the Atlantic Ocean or the Pacific. He's talking about people. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 17 verse 15. That the waters that thou seest are peoples, tongues and tribes and kingdoms. So the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. And the forces, the forces there is the wealth. You know, when they get born again, they're going to bring their tithes and offerings to the church. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God. And the church is going to become the most powerful financial institution in the earth. You know, not only because of money that's going to come in, but because of the wisdom of God that's going to come from the fullness of the ability of the mind of Christ. So the church is going to have great creativity. It's going to have great um, innovation. It's going to take the things, problems that are existing now, you know, and solve them, get, get great insight, new dimensions. You know, I was reading something recently. I say this with a bias because my background is physics. You know, and uh, there are some certain um, platforms I subscribe to. You know, up till now I study and I, I read and find out what's going on and all of that. And one person wrote this now. He said, which was the greatest scientist of all time? Then he, he spoke about, you know, Galileo, Isaac Newton, um, Albert Einstein. And he came to this conclusion, which I agree with. I actually said this about 20 years ago. At the turn of the century, you know, this last century, around the year 2000, there was this debate amongst physicists that who was the greatest physicist? Was it Einstein? Or was it Isaac Newton? I said Isaac Newton. And I said there's a reason why. See, Einstein was building on the foundation of, um, of, of what Newton had done. Later on, uh, um, Michael Faraday, who had this concept of electric and magnetic fields, then um, um, James Clerk Maxwell and Faraday and Maxwell were born again Christians. You know, Maxwell now formulated it with mathematics. We call them Maxwell's equations. It is those equations that, that, that tell us how electromagnetic waves travel in, uh, in, in vacuum and in, and, and, and in media. That's what all of our electronics, radio, television, everything is based on up till today. Maxwell's equations. Now, Albert Einstein had all that mathematical foundation and background, and then he now uh, uh, had inspiration from God. Obviously, you know, even though he didn't he didn't know God like uh, uh, like uh, Maxwell and and uh, what's his name and Faraday, you know, and he uh, he 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 formulated firstly the principle of special relativity. Then there was something he did as we. Um, the electromagnetic effect, you know, the issue of quanta, which he got from Max Planck, you know, even the mathematics used for general relativity, somebody else had developed it. His name was Riemann. You know, it developed about 50 years before. His mathematics was not, that, was not as good as that of his peers. I'm talking about Albert Einstein. But he had great concepts and ideas. So he took the mathematics of Riemann, you know, and used it to formulate what we now call general relativity. He actually got his Nobel Prize not for general relativity. He got it for the um, photoelectric effect. Great man, great scientist. I'm not putting him down. But you can't compare him to Newton. Newton had nothing. Newton, Newton actually, you know, uh, uh, birthed, he, he conceived the calculus, which is the mathematics of small changes, in order to be able to come out with what we call, you know, uh, 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 Newton's laws of motion and all of that, and, and, and predicted the movement of all the planets and the stars and, and, and the force of gravity. God showed him. And I believe God is going to show us in this end time. It's one of the things I'm pursuing. Praise the Lord. Anyway, 
You know, so that's why kings will come to the brightness of our writing. The forces of the Gentiles, God's going to give the church this type of knowledge, this type of innovation that's going to create new wealth. Wealth we have never, we can't even begin to imagine. And to explain this, I always use um, the illustration or the example of um, our dear friends, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and others, you know, who... You know, as young men in the 70s, you know, just had an idea of, you know, making computers from what they used to be in the 60s, these big mainframes, you know, and then we had, you know, we had, we had what we call uh, mainframe computers, then we had mini computers which are used for experimental labs and all of that, you know, to what we now call the microcomputer, which is what put it on the desktop and the laptop. And then finally we got the iPhone and, you know, the, the phones and all of that. It was, a great, it was a quantum leap. And it created new wealth. Before Bill Gates and, 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 and Steve Jobs, you know, when men were rich, they were rich in the hundreds of millions. They, were, they broke the barrier into billionaires. And not 5 billion, 10 billion, 100 billion. And that's the threshold now, you know. We're now seeing going into, you know, so I believe that what's coming will, the kind of wisdom and and the innovation that's going to come is going to create new wealth that's going to go into the trillions and the quazillions. Let let me explain. A billion is 1,000 million. A trillion is 1,000 billion. A quazillion is 1,000 trillion. That kind of wealth has never been seen. It's that kind of wealth that can lend to nations. It's that kind of wealth, you know, that can fulfill what the Bible actually says. Where it says that, you know, I will make you head and not tail, above only and not beneath. You know, you will lend unto many nations, you will not borrow. How can you lend to nations if you yourself... I mean, most nations now, their debts and their deficit is in the trillions. So if somebody has, if somebody creates kind of wealth... That gives him, you know, a uh, uh, hundred trillion. He can say, America, I take this five trillion. You take this one. And he won't touch him. So is it impossible? Of course it's not. With God, all things are possible. That's where we're actually going. Now, that wealth is going to be a part of it. I don't know how I got off on that, but it was good. Praise the Lord. Like Ellen Hagen says, you know, I preached me happy. Amen. So, uh, this is what this, my Christian songs of God is all about. Get church to perfection. Give us the wisdom of God. You know, so that we can help, you know, solve the problems of the world, you know, uh, brought about by this, uh, the perils of the end time due to man's collective and cumulative sins. And then cause the Gentiles, the nations to come to the church and it's going to bring in a harvest of people that are going to be born again. You know, there are a lot of people, some prophets have prophesied of a billion soul harvest. I'm going beyond that. By the grace and the mercy of God, by revelation, what God is showing me, you know, it's not just going to be a billion. You know, I believe that we're looking at, before we leave the planet, before the rapture, I believe this. And I have, I have scriptural um, prophetic pointers. You know, this kind of revelation is not um, black and white, you know, you, you, it's, it's a hidden manner. You know, you know what God said? He said that, he has 7,000 that hasn't bowed his knee to be. He was speaking prophetically, you know, uh, symbolically about Israel. But now we're looking at the whole world, you know. And I believe God, Lord was showing me, you know, that, you know, before you're done with this thing, you should have 700 million. That's going to carry the bird anointing. You can understand now, with that, of course will come to pass the scripture that we shall cover the, the glory of God shall cover the earth as what has covered the sea. 700 million is enough to cover all the nations of the earth. More than enough. But that's not all. Hello? That's just the, that's just the, 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 the disciples that carry the glory. But the harvest they will bring in, that is the people that will get born again, you know, through their ministry. The world population right now is about, you know, between, somewhere between 7 and 8 billion. You know, in another 20, 30 years, that thing would have gone up to, say, about 9, 8 point something, maybe 9 billion. You know, if you look at the trajectory, the statistics. I believe this. 
you know, time may prove me right, it may prove me wrong. Uh, like Paul said, I'm not saying, thus saith the Lord, but I perceive, you know, by the Spirit of God. I believe that we will bring in at least a three billion man harvest. Minimum. And I think we'll even do more than that. Now, not all of them will be into glory and all of that, but they'll get born again. And many of them will get filled with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know, three billion. Three billion. I'm not, people have prophesied one billion. I, I'm looking at three billion. Three billion. Amen. And why not? It's less than half the population of the earth. The whole population is about eight, nine billion. Let's just say pro approximately. So we're only taking one third. Thank God for that. Amen. Now if you look at the tabernacle of Moses, you find that, you know, if you look at the whole tabernacle, you find that the one third is the holy place and the most holy place. Two thirds is the outer court. Okay, leave them alone, but let's take the one third. Anyway, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So we've got a lot of work to do. So let's, let's get to Jesus now. In John chapter 4, we stopped in our last lesson. We actually finished um, uh, where Jesus healed uh, the nobleman's son and he discouraged you know, faith in miracle, in seeing physical miracles. He said, except you see miracles, you will not believe. So he now said, your son is healed. So the, the invisible word was sent and the man believed and the son was healed. And so God was telling us there that we should believe in the invisible word. You know, and, and another great example of that is the story of the Roman centurion. Who they sent to G he sent to Jesus, his, sick, his servant was sick. And, and, and Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. And he said, you don't need to come, just speak the word. Now, hey, the centurion couldn't see the word. The word is invisible. I'm speaking now, you can't see what I'm saying. But it, the, 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 the words we speak, they are spirit and they are life. It is the life, having faith in that invisible reality, that's real faith. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You know, and let's quickly review that scripture. It's in Hebrews chapter 11. I didn't, I, I didn't plan to do this in my notes, but I'm going to, you know, particularly the Amplified Bible. Right. Now, this is what it says. It says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation of the title deed of things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see. See, everybody wants to see something. That's not going to build your faith. Learn to have faith in the invisible you cannot see. The conviction of their reality. Faith, perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the five physical senses. That's real faith. And that's what Jesus was encouraging. He said, except you see miracles, you do not believe. Then the man now believed in when Jesus said, thy son liveth. What did he believe in? He believed in the word that Jesus spoke. And by believing in that invisible reality, it actually came to pass. And so God is encouraging all of us. The Bible says he sent his word and healed them. See, at the beginning of every prayer I pray here in the service, you, you hear me say, you know, and release the power of God to back these words, you know, to, 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 to heal them, to deliver them, to pray. Have faith in that. I don't have to come to your house to lay hands on you or put anointing on your head. As I'm speaking now, you can get healed. Because the words I'm speaking by the grace and the mercy of God have spirit and they have life. And that life is medicine to your flesh. If you would believe it, like that noble man, believe the word Jesus said. Before he got home, the boy was healed. And before we finish this service, you'll be healed. In Jesus' name. And delivered from any kind of evil spirit oppression that may be in, in, your, in, in your circumstance or situation. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so, that's what it's all about, folks. You know, uh, and uh, uh, Jesus, Jesus taught us that. And so today we start with chapter 5. I'll see how far the Lord will help us with that. He says, and after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, there is at Jerusalem, by the sheep market, a pool, which is in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of important folk, of blind Halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. 
And a certain man was there which had an infirmity thirty and eight years. When Jesus saw him lie and knew that he had been now a long time in that case, he saith unto him, Will thou be made whole? Observe, Jesus was looking for faith. And the important man answered him, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool. But while I'm coming, another steppeth down before me. Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. And immediately, everybody shout immediately. That's a spirit without measure in operation. Immediately, the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day, <laughs> was the Sabbath. Jesus therefore said unto him that was cured. It is the Sabbath. The Jews, excuse me. Therefore said unto him it, that was cured. It is a Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. And he answered them and said, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. And they asked him, What man is that which said unto thee, Take up thy bed and walk? And he that was healed wist not. He didn't know who it was. You know, for Jesus had conveyed himself away, a multitude being in that place. Verse 14. Afterward, Jesus findeth him in the temple and said unto him, Behold, thou art made whole. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come unto thee. Let me just, you know, say this. This is still true today. You know how people say, if, if, if really God really healed you, can the thing come back? Of course it can come back if you do the wrong thing. Does, it doesn't do away with the veracity of the original healing. Hello? You know, if it's God, you know, then he can never come back again. No. No. That's why I said, sin no more. And then he also gives us a hint here. The, the, the connection between sin and sickness. In other words, sin is the root of sickness. If you live a clean life and stay away from sin, you know, you can overcome practically any sickness. And, and when we talk about sin now... Uh, the Holy Spirit just quickly nudged me there. You know, we're not just talking about moral sin alone. You know, when we think about sin, people always think about lying, stealing, adultery, fornication, drinking, and all those kinds. Those things are bad. Don't misunderstand me. But you know, many times, uh, the sins that are causing some of our problems are not sins of commission, but sins of omission due to a lack of knowledge. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. The, the, the root of Job's problem was a lack of knowledge of spiritual law and keeping it. And that was the door through which Satan came and did all the bad things he did to Job. Then when God appeared to Job, he said to him, Who is this whose counsel is our, and his words are without knowledge? Then God now corrected him, and the Bible says, And Job prayed for, he, he, before he was making sacrifice of animals. Which is not wrong, but you know, it was not wrong in that economy and in that day. But what he needed to do was to operate spiritual law and start speaking God's word. And when he did, the Bible says, and God turned Job's captivity. And then gave him twice what he had before. And incidentally, the Bible says, you know, the rest of his days was just, you know, what the Bible, what Job himself said, you know, or, or one of his friends said, if they obey and serve him, they will spend their days in prosperity and their years in pleasure. And it's going to be part of my message on Sunday. You know, God doesn't just want us to be going from one trouble to another to another trouble. Your life is not going to be full of trouble. You learn to do this thing, sin no more, you know, and walk with God. And you're going to be going from victory to victory. And even when you do have troubles, you're able to overcome them quickly. Hallelujah. And majority of the time will be pleasures, years of pleasures and prosperity. It won't be years of suffering and, and, and afflictions and all of that. They will come, but you overcome them. And the man departed. <laughs> what, a, what, what a guy. And told the Jews <laughs> it was Jesus which had made him whole. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him. Can you imagine? Look at the human heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. The man didn't do anything. He just healed a man on the Sabbath. And because of that, they wanted to kill him. Kill! You didn't do anything. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Can you imagine? They were killed. The Sabbath was more important to them than the man who was being healed. And then they now wanted to kill the person. It's not them actually. It's the devil. That's why Jesus said, you are the father, the devil. It's Satan operating through their mind, their will and their emotions 
wanting to kill the Son of God. Amen. And let, 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 let me stop there for now and let's quickly review this portion of scripture and see how the Lord takes us. Now watch this. He says, after this, now this is something very, very unique about the um, Gospel of John. Uh, no, I don't think it's unique, but it's, it's a great characteristic. John writes sequentially, chronologically, after this. So you have to ask ourselves, after what? After the woman at the Samaritan well, after the healing of the nobleman's son, after Jesus' disciples had started baptizing people with water in Judea. And the Pharisees began to compare Jesus and John the Baptist. The Bible says, and Jesus departed and left Judea and went into Galilee. It's very important to keep the sequence of events at the back of your mind. And I'm going to tell you the reason in a minute. Because if you don't, you will not appreciate why John said after this. See, let, 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 let's, let's, let's wind back. Let's wind back. What happened? Jesus is born, you know, John doesn't even go into all of that. He just said in the beginning was the word. He doesn't go into the birth of Christ. The three other gospels do that, you know, the Christmas story. Then what we see is we see the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 2. We, we see him come to John the Baptist, get his first disciples. Uh, you know, Andrew and John, you know, uh, uh, then uh, Peter, Peter, then James, and then Philip and Bartholomew. So those six guys went with him, and the miracles start in Cana of Galilee. Immediately after Cana of Galilee, and uh, there's a reason why I'm going through all of this. He goes to the feast of Passover is at hand. So he goes to Jerusalem, you know, for the feast of Passover with those six disciples and he heals the sick. It, the Bible does not give us the details of who he healed and how many. It just says he did miracles and that many of them believed in him and then he didn't trust them because he knew what was in man. After that, he's still in Judea, in Jerusalem. Nicodemus comes to him. And, you know, he talks to Nicodemus and all of that. You know, when he finishes, uh, um, John is recording, because John was with Jesus throughout. Don't forget, John was an eyewitness, because he was there. That's why he could write this thing, the way he wrote it. You know, so he goes, you know, so then this question of the competition arises. John the Baptist, sadly, you know, and regrettably, continues to baptize people, which he shouldn't have done. He should have just closed that down. Joined Jesus, and then he just wanted him baptizing people that could have been baptized because Jesus was not baptizing, but his disciples were. The Bible says, when Jesus knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus baptized more people than John, God does not like human earthly competition. You know what Jesus did? The Bible says he left there and he went into, he left Judea. Now, for those who are not, we Gentile Christians who don't have the geography at the back of our mind, you have to understand Galilee was a separate region from Judea. Judea was where Jerusalem was. You know, all of that is Judea. Galilee is a little bit further down. That's where you have Capernaum and, and Chorazin and all of that. Usually it's about two, three days journey back in those days. Today is about, I'm told, you know, about 70 something, 100, 100 kilometers and all of that. So it, it takes time to move from Judea to uh, Galilee. So what happened was this. When Jesus was now going back to Judea, that's when he goes through Samaria. Because he must need, he could have, because the Jews used to shun the Samaritans. So ordinarily, most Jews would not go through Samaria. They would take a detour. But it's a mile along the way. But Jesus, you know, because God, the Holy Spirit was obviously leading him. He went through Samaria. Then he meets the woman. He blesses her, you know, you know. And then the people come out. He spends two days there. And then finally... He now goes, leaves uh, uh, Samaria and gets into Galilee. As he's coming to Galilee, he gets to Cana. Uh, he gets to Cana. This, there's a nobleman whose son is sick in Capernaum. All of this is in Galilee. He says, come and heal my son. Jesus says, mm. 
except you see miracles the guy must have heard about the miracles that happened in jerusalem you know you won't believe your son is living don't worry and the man believes the word he goes down before he gets home the boy is healed amen then john now says after this so you've got to have all that sequence at the back of your mind after this there was a feast now question which feast I'll tell you, you know, I don't know. But it's one of these two. I know this is certain. But I don't know which of them. It's either Pentecost or Tabernacles. Why? Because Passover has just happened after Cana of Galilee. All of this sequence of events came after Passover. And by the time you go to John chapter 6, you see Jesus feeding the 5,000. And feeding 5,000 was just before the next Passover. So I know that this feast was in between the two Passovers, and the, the, which is one year. And there were two feasts that all the males are supposed to go to Jerusalem for. They will go three times a year. You go at, Pente you go at Passover, then... Three months later, approximately, not exactly three months, you know, maybe two months and some weeks later, you go back again for the Feast of uh, uh, Pentecost. And then, four months later, you go back again for the Feast of Tabernacles. So, I know that this feast is either Pentecost or Tabernacles. Now, I'm not sure which it was. I suspect... It probably was tabernacles. Why? Because, you know, it talks about, you know, a whole multitude of people going out of that. You see, Pentecost was a smaller feast than the other two. It's only a one-day feast. Even though they would sacrifice an animal and they would bring their first fruits, you know, to, to Jerusalem to come and worship the Lord. With it. Passover is a seven-day feast. Tabernacles is a seven-day feast. So many people, back after thousands and thousands and thousands of years, and because Passover, sorry, Pentecost is so close to Passover, what, I, I'm not saying what they did was right, but my, my people will just say, look, once he goes for Passover, he will go back home. You know, and then he will wait until Tabernacles before he goes again. You know, and that was what Peter was saying when he says a yoke that neither us nor our fathers can you imagine the you know the the the, the drudgery you know you you, you 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 i remember they didn't have cars in those days it's not like today where you can just get in the car and within one hour you're in jerusalem you know you're going to go through donkey and camel and everything you know you will for example people who lived in galilee who lived in capernaum cana you know nazareth all those places they were you know, like two, two days, three days journey by, by horse and, or, or donkey or camel. So it was a lot of ala. It was a lot of trouble in Nigeria. We say, well, you know. So most people would go for Passover because you, 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 you spend seven days in Jerusalem. You know, you're able to take time, rest, play around, see your friends, blah, 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 go to the temple and all of that. But Pentecost only one day. So I come all the way. I do a two-day journey for a one-day celebration. And immediately after that, I'm going back again. And then come back again in four months. <clears throat> Let me just. Would it be Johnson's suspicion? Hello? So I suspect it was the Feast of Tabernacles. But it could have been, it could have been, it could also have been Passover, you know. But Jesus, interestingly, always obeyed. He never said, oh, this was, he would go for Passover, he would go for Pentecost, he would go for Tabernacles, because it was God's instruction, and Jesus never broke the law. Are you listening to me? So, it was at this feast, whether it was Passover, whether it was Pentecost, whichever, sorry, whether it was Pentecost, whether it was Tabernacles, he goes up, and when he gets to Jerusalem, there's a sheep market. Now, uh, that's another important point here. You know, for those of us who are Gentile believers... You know, and, and, and don't understand the Old Testament and all the things that used to happen. Uh, you see, John wrote these things to Jews and Gentiles. Don't forget John was a Jew. You know, for all the, 
authors of the New Testament were all Jews except Luke. And he had a strong Jewish influence because Paul was his spiritual father and mentor. You know, and so uh, you have to understand that um, when they went to the feast, you had to kill animals and sacrifice. Go and read it. You see it's in Exodus, it's in Leviticus. I don't have time to turn there. You know, even the Pentecost, you had to, you had to, take, you had to bring your first fruits. Watch this. They will bring the first fruits of the wheat harvest. There were three harvests in Israel every year. I'm talking about agricultural harvests. There was the barley harvest. The barley harvest is the one that takes place, you know, around Passover. Then, about three months later, there's another harvest, which is wheat. That's the Pentecost harvest. Then, four months later, there's the fruit harvest. That's when they harvest the grapes from which they make wine and a lot of other, you know, fruits and all of that. You know, so those were the, those were the three harvests. Now, the Pentecost harvest was a harvest of wheat. So they would take the wheat, they'll take the first fruits of it, they'll take it to Jerusalem to give to the temple. Then they would take an animal, you know, like, a, in fact, there were, there were two. There was, there was a kid that you, for a sin offering, then you take a lamb, you know, um, 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 some... Um, bullock, you know, I think two of them, I can't remember the deal, it's not important you know, and they will sacrifice that's why there was a sheep market so when they got to Jerusalem because yeah, you, you can't start carrying goats all the way from, from Galilee you understand they might take the, the wheat they can maybe just wrap that one that's convenient, but you know by the time you start carrying a goat and all that it's, you know, and you, you have to come with a caravan and come with a with, with, with camels or come with a with donkey or a horse. And it's not convenient at all. So it's when they get to Jerusalem that they now go to the sheep market and buy the goat and buy this, the, um, this thing that they are going to take to the temple to sacrifice. That's all the background behind all of this. Is this clear? So he says, now, there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool. Which in the Hebrew tongue, Bethesda, having five porches. Another message for another day. And in this lay a great, everybody shouted, great multitude. Great multitude. Now, I discovered something by studying the Bible carefully. The way anytime the Bible says multitude, it's talking about 5,000 and more. Hello? You know, the Bible says he's fed the multitude. And we know it says 5,000 be, be, beside women and children. I'm, I'm, this is just a statistical ap approximation. So when the Bible says a great multitude, he's not talking about a hundred people. You're looking at a thousand, two thousand, five thousand. Hello? Now that's a lot. Hello? And he tells us, you know, the kind of ailments they had. They were blind. They were halt. Halt means they had some kind of physical um, deformity. They couldn't walk. Do you understand? Maybe the, the, the leg was broken or maybe it never grew properly. You know? Uh, they were withered, like the man with the withered hand. You know? Waiting for the moving of the water. Now, look at God's mercy and kindness during the Old Testament. At this time in the history of the nation of Israel, Jesus had come by, you know, by this time. You know, but God in his mercy would cause a, a sovereign move of God. He would cause an angel to come down from heaven and he would trouble the water at the pool. And anybody who first stepped into the water, whether he was blind, he would instantly become, he could get his sight. If he was halt, he would start to walk. You know, if his hand was withered, it would grow out. You know, and all of that. And people knew. That that thing will happen and watch this. See God's kindness. He would do it at the feast. Because at the feast everybody comes. He would do it at the feast. So uh, this was the pattern. Only God knows how many years this had been going on for. It's probably been going on for. And the whole Jerusalem, everybody knew. So everybody will take his uncle, his daddy, his, his, his something. Anybody that had a kind of, the one that was blind. the one that was, And they will take their relatives. And everybody will get near the pool. And everybody's waiting. 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 
for the moving of the water. Once the water moves like this, everybody rush! Because it's only the first person. After that, nobody else gets healed. Somebody say, ah, why didn't God heal all the others? Well, they were in a backslidden condition. The nation was not where it should be spiritually. You know, they didn't have any but people who were developed spiritually. You know, this is probably due to the intercession of some people like Anna and Simeon. And there was this, just, you know, uh, there's this song we sing. You know, mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers. There were no showers. There were only just these little mercy drops. You know, and, um, and then anyway, with, thank God. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not complaining, but, you know, I mean, but if, the, if they had more people who were praying, if they had more people who were spiritual, they would have had more. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came. You know, there was a great lack of spirituality at the time in terms of numbers. You know, that's why you, you say, you say, Jesus, how surprised he was. Well, no, I don't know whether I should use the word surprise, but yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was aghast, if I can use that expression. He said, Nicodemus, a, a, a teacher, I know it. So those are the kind of people who are teaching them. Whereas they should have had teaching priests and Levites who would have been teaching people about God and prayer and the word of God, and they would have had more miracles. And incidentally, had that been the case, they would have appreciated Jesus. And followed him. Rather than criticize him like they did. You know and persecute him. Anyway. So the, it was in this situation. The Lord Jesus comes to the feast. So he, I mean Jesus is a man. You know he was, he was aware of what was going on. So he goes to that pool. Of Bethesda. This would have been a great time. For the Lord Jesus to heal everybody. We, we, we read this in other parts of the gospel. You know, it says, and virtue went out of him and healed them all. But he didn't do that here. There are two questions to ask. We're probably going to answer these questions in my next uh, lesson. Why? The answer to that is very simple. God didn't tell him. He only did what God told him to do. You know, then of course, the second reason, which I believe is, you know, is that, you know, there was so much unbelief. The same reason why he couldn't do so many works in Nazareth is the same reason why here in Jerusalem he couldn't heal a great multitude of these impotent folk because they had been taught the wrong thing, they believed the wrong thing, they, even if he came and told them they wouldn't believe. But the Holy Spirit I got to close. Leads the Lord Jesus uh, to one man in that whole multitude. Let, let's just, you know, hypothetically, let's just say 5,000. Look at that probability. Look at the percentage. One over 5,000. You know, and the man had been there for 38 years. Not two weeks, folks. 38. I'm sure his people brought him every year. You know. You know, or he would find a way of getting to Jerusalem or probably even live there. I don't know. You know? <laughs> and when Jesus saw him lie there and knew that he had been there a long time in that case, how did he know? There are two ways he could have known. The Bible doesn't tell us. You know, this again is speculation, but it's um, spirit inspired speculation, if I can use that expression. You know, and it is this. It could have been by a word of knowledge. The Holy Spirit just pointed the man out to him and said, that man's been there for 38 years. Go and heal him. Which it probably was. It could also have been by rumor and reputation. This man is being here for 38. Everybody's talking about it. In, you know, amongst the, amongst the people. He gets the ship back. Ah, they say that, uh, you know, you, and don't forget he wasn't alone. You know, he was uh, Peter, James, John. That's why John could write this. So maybe somebody comes and says, ah, you know, there's this, there's this man everybody's been talking about. He's been here for 38 years. You know, and so Bible says, when Jesus knew, he doesn't tell us how he knew, but he could have known either supernaturally or through somebody telling him. So he goes to him. Look, he deals with this guy one-on-one. -on -one. Will thou be made whole? The impotent man answered him and said, ah, sure, I want to be. This will be translation. 
you know, but, but you know, I, I don't get there in time. Before, you know, I have no man. When the water is troubled, you know, to put me into the pool while I'm yet coming. You know, for example, somebody who is blind and can walk will get there faster than somebody who is, who is impotent. Or maybe he has a relative there that's going to help him to quickly get to the water. He didn't have anybody. You know, 38 years is a long time. Folks, maybe his people used to help him before. After many years, people said, so he was just there alone. When you are alone, God will not forget you. When everybody says, when my father and my mother, when they forsake me, he said, the Lord will take me up. God will not forsake you. So Jesus goes to him, you know, and he says to him what he cannot do. Faith calls what is not as though it is. It says, rise, take up thy word, and walk. He cannot rise. The man is impotent. That's where faith comes in. That's why we have to believe the invisible word of God, even contrary to what our physical senses are saying. And then when we believe it and we say it and we act upon it, the power of God is released and that invisible reality comes into physical manifestation. And immediately, that's the power of the Spirit of God in our measure. The man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And the same day was the Sabbath. You know, and, 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 and Jesus, you know, and, 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 and the Jews, you know, these guys are, these religious people are so terrible. We're going to take this up in my next lesson. You see, brethren, the point I want us to make is this. Number one, God knows your number. He knows when everybody has forsaken you, God will not forsake you. And then you have to believe God's word. Even when your physical senses are telling you something different. Your experience. This man, he, he could have told Jesus, but you can see I can't walk. No. But he, he said immediately, the word, there is power, the, where the word of the king is, like I was sharing on Sunday, there is power. That power that came out of Jesus' mouth, when he says rise and walk, immediately went into the man's body. He must have felt something. And immediately he rose up and he took his bed and walked. Another important lesson I want us to learn is this. Do you understand? Jesus didn't heal everybody. He only healed the one that God sent him to. Now people find that difficult to understand and believe. But like I explained, there's a lot of background behind this. If you look at Bethesda too, when he healed the man that was, um, who couldn't talk, he said he took him out of the city. You see, even there can be an atmosphere of unbelief. And it will hinder the flow of God's power. Like what happened in Nazareth. And that's why all of us, when you come for our services like this, come with an, that's why we pray before the service. That's why that initial prayer and worship we do, they are all important. They are to prepare your heart so that you'll be in a place of faith. You'll be in a place of an attitude of believing. So when the word of God is coming out of my mouth like this or any other person who is preaching, you know, you can key into it. Like now, rise and walk. God will heal you. Whether it's coronavirus or any other thing, God will heal you. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let us pray.